Okay, I guess we are good to start. Thanks for coming here. It's the last session of the QCon. Glad to see you here. So my name is Antti. This is joint work with Ying, who unfortunately couldn't come here today. And we are going to talk about saving by swapping. So this is the problem that we are addressing in this talk. Insufficient memory, we would like to have, we would like to run more workloads with the nodes that we have without starting new nodes to the cluster and how swap is here to help. So the idea of swap is of course that some seldom accessed, hopefully seldom accessed data is written from memory to somewhere else so that that memory can be used by someone else. And when the owner of the data needs the data again, then operating system fetches the data back from somewhere else, back to the memory, and this is called page fault. And then the owner can continue. A little playful calculation, if you have 10 workloads running in your Kubernetes cluster, each of them requesting one gigabyte of memory, but actively using only 900 megabytes of it, then if you swap out this idle 100 megabyte per workload, then you could fit the 11th workload on that node. Doesn't sound much, but if you put it in the scale that we are dealing with here, implement it in like 100 uh, data centers in every server there, then you could immediately switch off like 20 coal power plants in the worldwide. So the scale makes it matter. And of course, it matters if you don't need to start up new nodes in your cluster. So, so good why it's not on B by default. So kubelet, a long time kubelet uh, refuses to start if it notices that there is swap. And now you can tell kubelet that, hey, there is swap, I know it, I actually put it there, don't care, just run. Uh, the reason for that behavior is that swap brings in performance cost because the page faults are costly. And it also brings in unpredictability because you don't know what, when the system is starts, starts to slow down. So Kubernetes was designed to run workloads that are sort of latency sensitive. They should respond in time. So swapping make, make that difficult. So the point of this talk is actually not to think of swap as like a one switch that is either on or off, but instead consider different uh, take different point of views to swapping so that you could make swap work so that you will get the benefits without suffering from the costs too much. So the questions are what to swap, how much to swap, where to swap, and when to swap, and then isolating the swapping effects. And finally, we are going to see that where to put the control logic of this whole thing so that we can implement the swapping that suits us. So what to swap? Uh, in Kubernetes currently, the swapping is based on QoS classes so that guaranteed containers are not swapped, but burstable are. Best efforts, uh, probably not. Um, but we could go in more detail level than that. And we should go, I think, if we want to make this work correctly and nicely with all workloads. So maybe swapping only certain pods that might be marked that yes, these can be swapped or even certain containers. And we can go even that low level that we start to swap only certain processes in certain containers. If they take a lot of memory and we, if we know that those can be swapped without hurting the performance too much. The other question, how much to swap? So this boils down to estimating the working set size of processes. Working set size means that the amount of memory that the process needs actively so that it runs smoothly. It's a different thing from resident size in memory that you can find 
for in the proc uh, process status for instance, which means that uh, the amount of memory that the process currently uses. So that might be bigger and it is often bigger than the process actually needs. But if you are swapping al already a lot in your system, then probably resident size is not big enough. So I will <coughs> demonstrate in this presentation that how you can detect working set size of your processes and of your containers. Third question, where to swap? So ZRAM is a block device in RAM and anything that you write to that block device gets compressed. You can actually, and because it's a block device, then you can also put swap there. So everything that you swap out gets actually compressed and still uh, stays in the memory. So it's pretty fast to get there back when it is needed on page four. Set swap is another, another, a bit similar thing. So it is also compressing memory that is being uh, swapped out, uh, but it, and it keeps it in the mem uh, memory, but it's there just for caching purposes. So there can be in the set swap case also like back end device that if there is not enough memory for, for storing this cached swapped out data, then it gets written in a consoled manner to the, to the backend device. And in the ZSwap actually in the latest Linux kernels, there's like hardware compression uh, enabled. So you don't even need to run the compression in, on CPU. Um, and this also works with ZRAM, so that's, that's also enabled. Uh, then there are, of course, physical block devices like non-volatile memory devices, SSDs. And uh, one option that is not actually swapping, but I would like to uh, uh, mention it here as well. So adding memory to the system, but you can add memory that is actually cheaper than the memory that you probably have, like DDR5 memory is pretty, pretty expensive compared to some CXL.mem modules. So those are cheaper, but they are also slower and they are also bigger. So you can, instead of swapping, go through your memory and see that what is not that actively used and push it to a different uh, memory physically. So that will allow you to continue without swapping, but having, having most needed data in fast memory and the rest in a bit slower, but it's not that slow after all, uh, unless you are doing something very performance critical. Um, next question, fourth one. So when to swap? You can leave the swapping completely to the operating system, so it will start swapping when there is memory pressure. Uh, the good thing is that the overall performance is pretty good. It runs fast. Uh, as long as there is memory, but when there is memory pressure, then everyone hurts. And this is probably one of the reasons why Kubernetes has it disabled originally. Uh, in Cxpus v2, there are then controllers and controls for saying that this particular container should start to swap out. So it has like container level memory pressure on memory.high control. And when that is reached, then operating system starts swapping, but it swaps only that container. So this already gives you a better limitation that how big the hit is to other workloads. Uh, going further, one thing that I'm demonstrating here is also like a um, new, new project, like first release from MemTRD, we did just before this conference. And their idea there is that you can, it's a user space demo first of all, and things you can do is um, also this kind of thing that you track the memory of some other workloads and de uh, define your own limits. That if, if some memory has been half an hour there without single access, then swap it out even though there wouldn't be any memory pressure. So you can do this kind of swapping on the background and try to push the situation where the memory pressure occurs as far future as possible. 
And another nice thing is that you can, uh, with this thing, you can control the bandwidth. So how many megabytes per second you would be swapping out. So this should be like less disruptive for the other workloads. Finally, how to isolate these swapping effects. So I already mentioned uh, this uh, limitation of swap out bandwidth. So when you do it very early in the, in the run, then, then you have time to do these kind of things. And also you can limit swap in bandwidth. So if there is some container that is uh, being swapped out a lot and when it really needs the memory, you might want to limit swap in bandwidth so that it does not consume all the bandwidth of the back end device, which would then again interfere with other containers. So this is good for those containers like low priority containers and others can keep on running while this is recovering from swap. Uh, this IO is configurable also in C groups V2 and V1 as well. So it's one of the OCI level parameters for the container. And speaking of OCI level, it's now good to step into the picture that where should we put this control logic of swapping. So container runtimes, both cryo and container D implement NRI server nowadays. And uh, that can be switched on from the container runtime configuration on both, both container runtimes. It will be on by default on container D 2.0. And that NRI server in the container runtime now enables uh, Kubernetes managed plugins. Well, any process in the system, but in, that includes Kubernetes managed containers uh, to connect to the NRI server and uh, then react on all pod and container lifecycle events. And in addition to reacting, they can make some adjustments to the OCI level parameters so that you can actually write even these memory.hi, memory.swap.max, and also block IO parameters. So this is one example of uh, NRI plugin, NRI memtrd plugin which is something that then runs this memtrd user space demo, daemon and it will run it inside the same container where it is living itself. So the NRI plugins, when they are launched, they uh, register to the container runtime and tell the lifecycle events that they are interested in. In this case, starting a new container. Uh, then because of that, the container runtime will tell that when, when it is starting a new container, and now the NRI plugin can react to that. And in this case, NRI memtrd plugin reacts by launching a new memtrd process that will watch that container. And because we are now an example, giving an example of working set size estimation, this memtrd process, what it does, it starts dumping uh, memory access data that it can find from those processes that are running in the real workload that we are tracking, so in the container X. So how does this look in practice? In the first line, we are adding NRI plugins repository to Helm. Then we are installing from that repository NRI memtrd plugin. Here we have an extra parameter. As I mentioned, these container runtimes, they don't have uh, NRI enabled by default yet, but when you are installing NRI plugin, uh, you can patch the runtime config, set this app option so that it will be switched on and then um, these NRI plugins can actually connect to the container runtime. So at repo, 
install plugin, and then you can see already that, okay, there it is running in its own pod. So it's a daemon set that runs on every node in your contain, uh, cluster. Okay, here's then an example workload that I'm gonna be tracking in this example. Never mind about the details, but the one thing that I want to emphasize here is this annotation. So it says that this class where this uh, workload that is put, and in this case only a single container, the class in which that belongs to is a track working set size class. So that's the name of a class. And when, then we just launch it. And I'll, how the memtier the NRI plugin configuration looks like, it looks like that, that there is a class called track working set size. And associated to that class, there is memtrd config, which is then the actual configuration that is given to the memtrd process that is launched when a new container belonging into this class gets started. So the other configuration, maybe I raise a couple of things. So here we say that we are interested in memory age that is being, uh, that's the time since the last access of, to the memory. And we are using idle page uh, tracker. Idle page is a Linux kernel interface which enables user space applications, user space processes to see that which memory pages have been accessed since the last reset of idle bit. And there are some parameters, maybe mostly, most importantly here, scan interval. So we are scanning every 20 seconds all the memory of the processes that are found in this C group. Here we could also, as I mentioned, we could go to the deep into the container and track only a single process. That is possible also by configuring um, pit watcher filter so that we would be filtering processes that are found in this C group. And finally, there is a routine that is being executed. So there is a memtrd command line uh, command running dump access seed uh, memory and then giving some intervals from zero to one minute, from one minute to 30 minutes, 30 minutes to two hours, two hours to one day, and then the rest. So how the result looks like, it looks like this. So here the uh, tracking has been just started all the memory that this process had at that point, not that much of memory, was like most recently accessed. But once it has been running for some time, we can see that like 70% of that memory of that process has been accessed somewhere between one minute and half an hour. So this already gives some idea on this particular workload, this process, that how it uses its memory. And works as a guideline for us to think that how to swap it. Um, then how to swap it. Let's see that also. Uh, we are using the same plugin, we, again using memtrd process there to say that swap out these process, this process ID and those addresses from it. So here's the different class now not only track, but here's like swap half an hour idle memory. So we are adding their allow swapping option. We are adding idle duration, means that if some page has not been accessed all the time in that duration, then it will be swapped out. And we are configuring also the mover that is that, okay, well, mover gets the address ranges and says that, yeah, they should be go to, going to swap, and this mover then interacts uh, like once in 50 milliseconds and uses bandwidth of 20, 25 megabytes per second to do the swap. 
but of course we don't need to use memtrd to do the swapping. We can use the C groups parameter, C groups consoles that I already mentioned. So there is an other, another NRI plugin, NRI memory QoS. This is like extremely simple plugin. So if you are interested in looking at that, how what NRI plugins could do, how they can control C groups, con uh, then you should look into this because I, it's so so small. So it says that it is interested in create container, not start container like uh, NRI MemTRD plugin. And when a new container is being created, it answers by giving memory.high and memory.swap.max values. Where it get those values, again, there is a like, class-based annotation. Uh, you can annotate your pod and a container inside the pod so that you swap that and that much of the memory Re, uh, resources memory limits that there are in that container. So these values are calculated based on that limit and the class. Okay, it's a lot of stuff, a lot of questions, but time to wrap up this. So what to swap, being more and more precise, will help you mitigating the effects and like isolating that who will actually suffer about on, on swapping and who will be uh, not affected that much. How much to swap working set size estimation is a good idea to understand. Uh, that amount, uh, MemTD offers some tool, something for that. There's MGLRU in Linux kernel that is also good for that. Um, we don't have uh, though Kubernetes integration to that, but anyway, something to look at if you are interested in. Uh, where to swap compressing in RAM is actually pretty interesting uh, scenario, possibly even hardware accelerated. Um, when to swap we can wait for memory pressure in the OS level, in the container level, or we can do swapping like beforehand, before anything happens. So try to avoid the memory pressure and try to keep the node behavior in that way predictable. I isolating swapping effect, that is something that you could do by uh, limiting this swap in, swap out bandwidth, block device controls and, and uh, your own daemon controllers and the control logic I would suggest to look at NRI plugins and, and MemTRD projects for that. So just mentioning the dependencies, um, container runtimes, recent versions, the NRI has been there for a while in both ContainerD and Cryo, so it's Mature, mature to use, good to use there. And uh, idle page tracking is not enabled in every uh, kernel by default. Ubuntu LTS release has it, but some others don't. So there are a couple of uh, kernel configuration options that need to be enabled to get idle page tracking working. And if there's room for in, in, uh, improvement here, uh, then at least this annotation, it's, it's nice for hacking, but if you would like to really like uh, schedule your ports to nodes that actually support some class, then, then this is, annotation is definitely not enough. There's a good cap QoS class resources that would solve this problem and solve many other problems as well. So we hope to, hope to get that and if you see it valuable, we'd be glad to see also your support there. Thank you so much for your attention. So. <laughs> Questions?
test. Okay, it works. Well, first, thank you for the talk. Um, I was wondering about the swap out. Um, when we have an application that needs to query memory that is being swapped, if we will limit its bandwidth to query this memory, it will affect latency to huge scales, possibly breaking SLAs and stuff. Yeah, that, that is the thing, I guess, that why swapping is disabled by, by default to, to have this, keep this SLS and keep the behavior uh, predictable. But, uh, but when you try to like push to your node even more workloads, then it comes boils down to the selection of what to swap and how much to swap and this kind of all these things to be able to keep the SLA. Um, which means uh, if I want to know how much do I, I can swap, I should be able to also evaluate how much bandwidth I need to swap, right? Uh, in this, with the current rule, am I able to track like drastic memory access changes, especially when it comes to bandwidth? Yeah, I, I think that these kind of things, typically they, in the end, they need measuring. And it's all workload dependent, depends on your SLAs as well, that what are the good values. And of course, all the, like for the bandwidth, what is the device where you are swapping to? So if you are compressing into memory, well, uh, there you don't need much bandwidth limitations possibly, but, but when you go to like slow devices, then, then it really makes a difference. Um, what are the real good values then depend on your hardware and environment, whatever is running there on your node. Thank you for a great performance. My question is related to Kubernetes scheduler. Could you please um, like share your thoughts about integrating information from memtrd to scheduling process? Process. I mean, for example, we know a lot of uh, how application uses uh, memory. Yeah, we have these stats. We know that, for example, this application it over requests memory and it's okay for it to use swap, yeah? And we can reschedule our pods using this information to okay. mitigate the risk of high latencies. Yeah, yeah. That, that's very interesting point. Thanks for bringing it up. Uh, I haven't actually looked into the scheduler too much. So I, I didn't even know that there is such a thing. And being able to provide like more metrics to that, more information about the usage then it would be very interesting and I think that it would make this more usable. <laughs> so it's a bit hackish, so it's in the early stage of development at the moment. So it would be nice to be able to provide users a Kubernetes way to get access to that data. Thanks. Okay. No more questions. You can go home now. The conference is over. <laughs> Thank you.